purport. Swayambhavamanu was very glad to see that his daughter Akuti had given birth to a both, a boy and girl. He was afraid that he would take one son and that because of this his son-in-law Ruchi might be sorry. Thus when he heard that a daughter was born along with the boy, he was very glad. Ruchi, according to his promise, returned his male child to Swayambhuvamanu and decided to keep the daughter whose name was Dakshina. One of Lord Vishnu's names is Yajna because he is the master of the Vedas. The name Yajna comes from Yajusham Patihi, which means Lord of all sacrifices. In the Yajur Veda, there are different ritualistic prescriptions for performing Yajnas and the beneficiary of all such Yajnas is the Supreme Lord Vishnu. Therefore, it is stated in Bhagavad Gita 3.9, Yajnarthat Karmanaha, one should act but one should perform one's prescribed duties only for the sake of Yajna or Vishnu. If one does not act for the satisfaction of the Supreme Personality of Godhead or if one does not perform devotional service, then there will be reactions to all one's activities. It does not matter if the reaction is good or bad. If our activities are not dovetailed with the desire of the Supreme Lord or if we do not act in Krishna consciousness, then we shall be responsible for the results of all our activities. There is always a reaction to every kind of action. But if actions are performed for yajna, there is no reaction. Thus, if one acts for yajna or the Supreme Personality of Godhead, one is not entangled in the material condition. For it is mentioned in the Vedas and also in Bhagavad Gita that the Vedas and the Vedic rituals are all meant for understanding the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna. From the very beginning, one should try to act in Krishna consciousness that will free one from the reactions of material activities. Thus, Andy Bhaktivedanta purports. So, this chapter in the beginning of the fourth canto describes the genealogy of the daughters of Manu. Here, Manu refers to Swayambhuva Manu. Swayambhuva Manu had three daughters and two sons. They have a responsibility to populate the universe with good progeny. Sat Santan. In the scriptures it is described that parents can beget good children by what is called as samskara. For civilized human beings, the Shastras prescribe samskara. So by samskara, it is possible to beget good children. And if somebody thinks that children are accidentally born, then such people are misled, mistaken. And therefore, there is a possibility that a child will be born with demoniac nature. In the scriptures it is said, Dvau Bhuta Sargau Lokesmin Daiva Asura Evacha. Uh, by birth, there are two kinds of beings who are born. Daivi Swabhava and Asuri Swabhava. These natures or these uh, characteristics, divine or demoniac, 
are different from the sattvic rajasic or tamasic behavior or conditioning of somebody who takes birth in this world this is very important to understand <clears throat> in the third canto there was a description elaborate description pregnancy of diti in the evening this entire chapter dedicated for that that is to help us understand how diti even though her desire her intention was to have a good child but because she violated the laws so therefore demons were born from her womb you see so there is a definite science behind procreation begetting children and that is very clearly explained in our scriptures it is not by chance or by accident some child is born good or bad no it's never the case so here the description is being given how the daughters of manu they are very responsibly begetting good children now this particular verse the preceding verses it is mentioned that even though swayambhuva manu had two sons and three daughters he handed over his daughter akuti to one sage ruchi prajapati ruchi on the condition that the son born of his daughter would be returned to swayambhuva manu to be adopted as swayambhuva manu's son now this is generally done by somebody who has only a daughter or only daughters when he does not have a son then he marries his daughter to somebody and on the condition that the son born of his daughter would be returned to him to be adopted later on <clears throat> now here swayambhuva manu is already having two sons so why did he uh, ask for the son of his daughter his grandson why did he ask for his grandson to be handed over to him so shri lavishwana chakravarti thakur explains swayambhuva manu knew that the supreme personality of godhead would appear as the son of akuti so therefore swayambhuva manu uh, made this request and it is explained here that akuti gave birth to twins a son and a daughter and is also described the son born of akuti was directly an incarnation of the supreme personality of god 
His name was Yajna. That is the name of Vishnu because he is Vishnu who is taking birth as a son of Akuti. And the female child was also incarnation of Lakshmi. Her name was Dakshina. So these uh, type of uh, uh, activities are all directly uh, the activities of the Supreme Lord. They are not ordinary activities of some conditioned soul. The Bhagavatam describes transcendental activities of the Supreme Lord and His devotees. What is the special thing about transcendental activities? They are all completely uh, free from the influence of the three modes of material nature. Here it is explained that Swayambhava Manu gladly brought home the beautiful boy named Yajna and Ruchi, the son-in-law of Swayambhava Manu, he kept with him his daughter Dakshina. And later on it will be described that Yajna married Dakshina. How is that? Because they are eternally related. So Lakshmi is the eternal consort of Vishnu. So therefore, Yajna married Dakshina. So these sort of uh, descriptions are given in the Bhagavatam to help us understand several things we can understand. That even though the Supreme Lord is completely aloof from the material modes and the material interactions, still he has a very special interest in this material world. What is his interest in the material world? His interest is to reclaim the conditioned souls and take them back to Godhead. That is his interest. And particularly the human form of life is especially meant for this purpose. And as it happens in this material world, because of being misled by the illusory energy, even civilized human beings forget the aim of life. Or they misunderstand the scriptures and become busy with different kinds of fruitive activities, philosophical speculation, so many material activities and miss the aim of life. So, in addition to giving us the scriptures, the Lord personally comes in order to teach what the scriptures are explaining, in order to uh, set an example for us by his own actions, he is showing us uh, the path of uh, uh, spiritual advancement. So it's explained here 
in the purport that the name yajna means the lord of all sacrifices in the bhagavad gita it is explained in the third chapter on karma yoga karma means activities which are binding us to this material world and karma yoga means activities which liberate us yajñarthat karmanah anyatra lokoyam karma bandhanah tadartham karma kaunteya mukta sanga samachar so very clearly it is explained in the bhagavad gita all activities should be performed as sacrifice to vishnu otherwise activities will be cause of bondage karma bandhana unfortunately in the modern civilization people do not know what is the meaning of karma bandhana they do not realize that there is a subtle uh, force that is acting what is the subtle force the three gunas in our present state we are completely under the the control of these three gunas and whatever activity we may do good or bad we are getting more and more entangled in the material world we want freedom from this bondage but foolishly we are getting more and more bound up and this is true not only for human beings on the earth this is true even for the demigods on the heavenly planets this is true for everybody even the demigods are misled into thinking that because they are performing pious activities they have got a license to enjoy in a pious way and therefore they consider their position as safe and secure there is a very interesting description in the krishna book the 10th canto of the bhagavatam that when krishna was in vrindavan he was engaged in his past times with the covered boys the covered men the covered women the covered girls all the residents of vrindavan but the demigods were watching that whenever kamsa would send some demon to kill krishna it appeared like krishna is a small boy and there is so much danger from these demons powerful demons but mystically every time the demon would be killed and krishna and the covered boys would always be completely safe so even though by reading the bhagavatam we understand that after all krishna is the supreme personality of god and who can kill him nobody can kill him. but that krishna was actually killing the demons is not very evident from the actions of krishna even for the demigods for the demigods it was always a mystery how did krishna 
escape. So it is not easily understood even by the demigods. This mystery is only known to the devotees. Other than devotees, nobody can understand. <clears throat> so, the description is given in the Bhagavatam, 10th canto, that when Agasura appeared in Vrindavan, he appeared as a big snake, a python. And Agasura's plan was that he is going to remain stationary by opening his mouth which appeared like a cave of a mountain because he was gigantic in size. And Agasura was expecting that the covered boys and Krishna will enter his mouth and then he is going to just swallow them and finish them off. And accordingly, the coward boys out of curiosity, they did enter the mouth of Agasura. And before Krishna could stop them, they had already entered. Then the demigods are watching. What is going to happen? Maybe this time Krishna cannot escape. So they are so much in anxiety, so much in anxiety, what is going to happen? Even though the Bhagavatam says, they had actually taken nectar and therefore they were actually uh, safe that they would not die untimely they would not die untimely akala mrityu no because they had taken amrita but still they are having so much of fear so much of anxiety On the other hand, the covered boys, simply because of their friendship with Krishna, they were completely free from anxiety. So whenever there was any situation which appeared little dangerous, what was the covered boys thinking? That even if there is some danger, Krishna is there. We need not fear for any situation. So this dependence on Krishna, this confidence because of their friendship with Krishna is only possible for devotees. It is not possible for even the demigods. It's not possible for the demigods. The demigods are also devotees of Krishna. But they are described as Sakama Bhakta. Sakama Bhakta. Sakama Bhakta means in exchange for their devotional service, they have some material desires to be fulfilled. And the scriptures describe all material desires are fulfilled only by one person, Krishna. So Krishna does fulfill the desires of the demigods in exchange for whatever service they are doing. But the demigods are unable to be free from anxiety. unable to be free from anxiety. Whereas the pure devotees of Krishna are never in anxiety. 
under any circumstances never in anxiety so it is possible to be completely free from anxiety only by pure devotional service similarly whatever activities one may perform in this world one can be free from all reactions only if one performs such activities as yagna that means tadartham karma kaunteya mukta sanga samachara all activity should be performed for the satisfaction or the pleasure of the supreme lord vishnu only then we can be free from reaction as prabhupada explains in this purport reaction whether it is good or bad it is ultimately binding us it is the cause of bondage karma bandhana whereas a devotional service pure devotional service or activities performed as sacrifice for vishnu sometimes even the sacrifices are misunderstood just like indra yagna somebody may think that indra is the beneficiary of such yagna no that's a wrong understand all yagnas the only beneficiary is krishna the only beneficiary is krishna nobody else hmm? that's why proper says the word yagna comes from the words yajusham patihi the lord or the master or the enjoyer of all sacrifices all sacrifices he is the only enjoyer in the bhagavad gita bhuktaram yagna tapasam sarvaloka maheshwaram bhuktaram he is the only enjoyer aham hi sarva yagna nam bhukta cha prabhu reva cha he is the master he is the only master only enjoyer of all sacrifices this is the secret this verse aham hi sarva yagna nam appears on the ninth chapter in the third chapter yagnarthat karmana there one may think that since vishnu is the maintainer of this material world therefore one should do all activities uh, for the sake of vishnu who is the maintainer and who will provide all the necessities will provide all our necessities there will be no scarcity there will be no want but the actual position of vishnu not just as the maintainer of this material world of everyone because he is in a position as the maintainer the creator brahma maintainer vishnu and destroyer shiva this is another conception people have of the topmost among the demigods trimurti these three personalities are the topmost among all the devatas brahma vishnu and shiva but what is the general understanding of people that brahma is creator vishnu is maintainer shiva is destroyer so they have different ideas about the relative position what is the relative position of these three personalities something that all the three are equally powerful something no brahma is more powerful something no shiva is more powerful something vishnu is more powerful yet others think oh there is durga who is above brahma vishnu and shiva why because in another place it described srishti sthiti pralaya sadhana shakti reka because the word sadhana is used in brahma samhita but otherwise the creator maintainer and destroyer of this material world is durga so because of which they say shakti is above brahma vishnu and shiva shakti is supreme 
Shakti is the one who is creating, maintaining, destroying through Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. All kinds of conceptions are there. And there are yet others who think that there is something beyond even Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Shakti, all the devatas, all created beings, that is something impersonal, some impersonal Brahman. That impersonal Brahman assumes forms of Durga, assumes form of uh, Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, devatas, the jivas, some kind of conception like this. So, all these are incomplete, incorrect, imperfect understanding of what is the actual truth behind this whole creation. It is very difficult to understand simply by uh, studying the Vedas, simply by uh, doing some sacrifices, simply by doing some pious activities, doing some mystic yoga practice by all these methods you can never understand the ultimate truth behind this material creation it's not possible only those who are devotees only those who engage in pure devotional service they are able to understand what is the truth behind this whole material existence that Krishna is behind everything Krishna is the absolute truth. Krishna is the ultimate personality uh, of God. So, that Krishna is present as Vishnu. He is the maintainer. He is also the creator in his form as Garbodakashayi Vishnu. He is also the creator. He is the destroyer in his form as Sankarshana or Shesha, Ananta Shesha. Uh, so, that same Supreme Lord is the creator, is the maintainer, is the destroyer. His energy is Durga, personification of his energy for the sake of this material creation, maintenance, destruction. Srishti, Stiti, Pralaya, Sadhana. Sadhana means the agency. The agency of creation, maintenance, destruction is Durga Devi who is actually the maid servant of Krishna who is acting exactly according to the will of Govinda. Ichana rupam api yasya cha cheshtate sa Durga conducts herself exactly according to the will of Govinda. The, the carriers of the will of Govinda are Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. They direct Durga Devi. Durga Devi acts in three ways. Sattvagun, Rajogun, Tamogun. So, Sattvagun is directed by Vishnu. Rajogun is directed by uh, Brahma. And Tamogun is directed by Shiva. So as directors, they are present, Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva. But the direction also is not uh, independently done. Of course, Vishnu is Krishna himself. So Krishna only is directing in the form of Vishnu, Sattvaguna. But Rajoguna and Tamoguna are directed by Brahma and Shiva according to the uh, super direction of the supreme direction of Krishna. So they are empowered personalities <clears throat> exactly according to the will of Govinda they act because they are empowered by Govinda. So, this truth or this secret is only understood by devotees. Now, if all activities are performed as yajna, then there is no bondage. Now, how to do all activities as yajna? 
So, the ritualistic uh, way of performing all activities as yajna is one method. That is the uh, description in the scriptures that all grihasthas especially and in general everybody who follows the Vedic ritualistic method of offering a sacrifice they have to do pancha maha yajna pancha maha yajna so this pancha maha yajna is very much difficult to perform in kali yuga very difficult to perform impractical for most people then in the system of uh, cultivation of knowledge uh, by cultivating spiritual knowledge one is able to avoid hmm, reaction to their activities because then they actually dedicate all their activities in pursuit of transcendental knowledge jnana yajna that also is very difficult in Kali Yuga hmm? to actually uh, uh, perform this sacrifice of dedicating all activities in pursuit of transcendental knowledge is very difficult then in mystic yoga system uh, the yogi actually uh, minimizes all his bodily demands and comes to the state where he simply is uh, maintaining his body by maintaining the circulation of pranavayu. So very difficult austerities leading to pranayama which is uh, control of the pranavayu circulation by cutting down eating solid food, cutting down even drinking water, cutting down even intake of air and coming to the state of total equilibrium within the body of the circulation of pranavayu. And in that state, the yogi becomes free from all external influence of the gunas. And then he is able to uh, fix his consciousness on the Vishnu, meditation on Vishnu. And then he becomes completely absorbed in such meditation and in that way, he is able to avoid all material activities. Then his activities are free from all reactions. But that's a very, very, very difficult process. But in Bhakti Yoga, it's very, very easy to perform all activities as yajna. What is that? Yat karoshi yadashnasi yat juhoshi dadasi yat yat tapasya sikaunte ya tat purushvamadarpanam. Simply do everything, whatever you do as an offering to me. So this doing all activities as offering to Krishna is again in the Bhakti Yoga system is taught by the Acharya. You have to learn this from the Acharya, how to perform all activities as offering to Krishna. How to do that in Bhakti Yoga? So Chaitanya Mahaprabhu teaches that you first of all begin by chanting Hare Krishna. By chanting Hare Krishna, Gradually, your consciousness becomes spiritualized. Now, in spiritual consciousness, your actions will completely be changed from material activities to spiritual activities. This is again a mystery for people who follow other yoga systems. That how these devotees, simply by chanting Hare Krishna, they are able to perform all activities as yajna. 
Sankirtan Yajna is a mystery for non-devotees. But it's a fact. When we spiritualize our consciousness, then whatever activity we may do, all those activities will be completely reaction free. They'll all be free from reactions. So this is explained in the Bhagavad Gita. If you study the Bhagavad Gita carefully, you'll understand how activities which are done in transcendental consciousness. Krishna therefore in the Bhagavad Gita reveals three kinds of activities. Normally people know only two kinds of activities, Papa and Punya, pious and impious activities. Uh, but there is a third kind of activity called, Krishna describes it as Karma, Vikarma, Akarma. This Akarma is not to be found in uh, other scriptures which describe elaborately what is the nature of material activity, what are the kinds of reactions uh, and good and bad reactions. The gradual process through stopping all sinful activities and performing only pious activities is to elevate oneself to ultimately go to Brahmaloka and wait for the end of Brahma's life in Brahmaloka and along with Brahma get liberation from material existence. This is a gradual process. Can imagine how slow it is, how gradual it is and how risky it is because in trying to elevate oneself at any stage one may fall down. No place in the material world is a person immune to performing sinful activity. No place. Abrahma Bhuvana Loka Punaravarti Norjana. Of course, that means uh, every place is a place of repeated birth and death. Why repeated birth and death? Because there is a possibility of performing some fruitive activity even in Brahma Loka. Generally, those who are done with all these fruitive activities of good and, I mean, uh, good reactions and enjoying materially, only they are allowed to enter Maharloka, Janaloka, Tapoloka, Satyaloka. But even from that position, there is a possibility of falling down to, to the lower position or lower situation. So therefore, uh, if somebody performs pure devotional service anywhere, in any position, any situation, Mami Partha Vyapa, again ninth chapter, the secret. Mami Partha Vyapashritya Yepisyu Papa Yonayaha. Even the most sinful person, if such a person is able to take shelter of Krishna and executes devo pure devotional service, that's only possible by mercy of Srila Prabhupada or pure devotees, acharyas like Prabhupada. And we see it practically. That what is not easily available even for the greatest of demigods has been made available by Prabhupada. See, there may be so many demigods who are engaged in pious activities. But they don't have easy access to pure devotional service. It's not that nobody is preaching among the demigods. Narad Muni is Devarishi. Devarishi means he is a sage amongst the devatas. So he is constantly preaching among the devatas. But nobody takes up pure devotional service as taught by Narada Muni. Therefore, sometimes Narada Muni, he sees that most people are not accepting, 
So sometimes he curses these devatas, like he cursed Nalakobara and Yami, <laughs> Mani Griva, the sons of Kubera. At least by his cursing, they are able to take up devotional service. That is his idea. Otherwise, Narad Muni is not interested in either cursing or giving some material benediction. He is not, he is a pure devotee, Acharya. He is not interested in that. But just so that they may accept devotional service, giving them an opportunity. So, like that, it's very, very rare that somebody takes up devotional service. But Prabhupada, he comes in this line of Lord Chaitanya. And Chaitanya's mission is, some or the other, make everyone accept pure devotional service. Some or the other. Induce the conditioned souls, the most fallen souls. It is evident in the pastimes of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Nityananda Prabhu and all the Panchatattva. That all kinds of sinful people, they took up pure devotional service through chanting Hare Krishna. Jagai Madai, most sinful people, how they took up devotional service by the mercy of Nityananda. There was one Gopal Chapa. <coughs> he was so very envious of the devotees. Even he, by the mercy of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and Srivas Thakur. Srivas Thakur, you should remember, is Narad Muni. Because Narad Muni is very, very much eager to distribute liberally this pure devotional service. So, he appears along with Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to distribute this pure devotional service in the form of Sankirtana as Srivas Thakur. So, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu made a plan to deliver this Gopal Chapel. So, <clears throat> it is described in the Chaitanya Chirtam. Like this, all the Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, his associates and all the Acharyas in the line of Chaitanya are thinking how to somehow engage all the conditioned souls in pure devotional service through the Sankirtana movement. So that is the... Uh, and Krishna reveals this secret in the Bhagavad Gita. Mahmi partha vipashritya yepi stupapa yonayaha striyo vaishastata shudra stepi anti paramgatim. In the gradual process, from whatever stage one is situated, one has to gradually elevate himself or herself to a higher status. And it's very, very slow. It's painfully slow. Whereas, somebody takes shelter of Krishna in pure devotional service, immediate elevation to the topmost platform. Pure devotional service. When we just say Krishna, Hare Krishna, immediately we come to the spiritual platform. And if we practice constantly chanting Hare Krishna, we are able to remain on the spiritual platform and we don't come down to the material platform. Then no more material activities, no more material bondage. And if you are situated in this Esha Brahmi Stiti Partha, Nainam Prapya Vimukhyati Stitva Syam Antakalepi Brahma Nirvanam Ruchati. We go back to Godhead, end of this life. If you are situated on the spiritual platform, in this position, of constantly chanting Hare Krishna, constantly engaged in devotional service. So practically speaking, to perform all activities is yajna is only possible by Bhakti Yoga and that too in Bhakti Yoga by constantly practicing, chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram, Ram. Thank you very much. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.